Far and wide, what the Acadian forests are most known for is their brilliantly colored autumns. But for those interested in mycology and mushroom foragers, this is one of the greatest times of the year. A time the deep forest offers abundant rewards, not only the beauty of its amazingly hued leaves and its dramatic skies, one moment sunny, the next riddled with storm cloud, but there is the charm of footfall over forest stuff, the crisp, sweet fragrance of the changing seasons. And for those in rural and more urban areas, there is an abundance of mushrooms coming in all shapes and sizes arising from the landscape, like an evocation of food, medicine, beauty, and mystery over a land where wildlife are on the move, and some, like the wasp which recently dwelt here, are vacating their homes. But if we press deep into the remote wildwood, down through the dales, and up to the high ridges where we can take in the full scope and majesty of this landscape, like an explosion of color if seen from the wings of an eagle, an avid mushroomer might find things far less common, yet worth the long trek into the deep and hidden places. And while it may be a long, long hike to find those unusual gems, the brilliance of a maritime autumn makes it more than worth it. Today we're going to press far back into some of the most hidden places of the forest, through highland ridges and vales of majestic Acadian forest, places where eagles and hawks hunt by day and owls rule the night, a landscape I share with martens and ermines, bobcats and lynx, American black bears and recently returned cougars, where trout hide in beshadowed streams, and a man can wander on foot or on horseback from sunup to sundown and never see another soul. It's a long trek, but to find such an unusual fungal gem, it's more than worth it. And the beauty of this amazing wild landscape more than makes up for all the effort. My faithful border collie Gilly Doo and I come upon a break of low wet ground where we must cross a brook that beavers have staked out as their own and built a lodge. And having found a narrow place where we could leap the little brook, we found ourselves striding through a break in the forest, the last ground to cross before coming upon a thick copse of spruces where the ground is covered with cool moss. And it was here we found the treasure that we came so far to obtain, Catathalasma ventricosum, a little known edible, more commonly known as the swollen stalked cat. The swollen stalked cat is a substantial mushroom, and the one lower center was enough to fill both my cupped hands. A mere dozen of them filled the foraging bag I had brought with me. This mushroom can easily be confused for Matsutake, another robust, similarly colored mushroom that likes to grow in the same habitat and even has a very similar appearance, but it is easily distinguished from Matsutake by smelling it. Matsutake smells like spice and old socks, whereas the swollen stalk cat either smells like nothing or it can be said to have a farinacea smell, which some people describe as doughy, and others describe as like melon or a bit like leather. To me it smells a bit like melon and dough. It is not too surprising that the Matsutake and the swollen stalk cat look very similar, because if we take a look at the scientific classification for them, we discover that they are both part of the order Agaricales. And indeed I can see their similarity to other Agaricales mushrooms. It's very evident. As you might guess, these are related to the common meadow mushrooms, which many people know, and also the common store-bought button mushroom, both of which are from the genus Agaricus. And both the Matsutake and the swollen stalk cat are a part of the family Tricolomarache, but there they differ, neither is in the same genus. Matsutake is in the genus Tricoloma, whereas the swollen stalk cat is in the genus Carathalasma. This mushroom is said to be found on the west side and the east side of the northern half of North America. However, there is considerable debate among mycologists as to whether this is accurate, and genetic testing has not yet been done to see if what is found on the east side and the west side of the continent are actually genetically similar. In the fungal kingdom, it is fairly common to find fungi that look very similar to one another, yet which are genetically, sometimes completely unrelated. Though the swollen stalk cat is a large and very interesting edible, very little documentation exists about it. Partly, this is because it is an uncommon mushroom, and I suspect that relates to why so many fungi have become uncommon in the modern world. Modern forestry, through the endless clear-cutting of wild woods and the endless creation of tree plantations, makes it impossible for many fungi to grow. Many fungi require stable ecosystems, forming symbiotic relationships with woodlands across decades and centuries and sometimes even millennia. Where these fungi cannot find correct conditions, they cannot flourish and even are extirpated. 
where I find them is only in remoter areas which have not been touched in decades. They like to grow among conifers, and I particularly find them among spruce, though I cannot guarantee they are mycorrhizal with spruce, because the conifer woods are often mixed, and one may find pine, fir, or even hemlock among them. Sadly, due to the dearth of information, there is also some debate about which trees they are exactly mycorrhizal with, or perhaps they can form relationships with many different kinds of conifers. They also like sloping ground, and typically I find them on fairly steep slopes, walkable slopes, but steep enough that you have to watch your footing on. And such ground is often wet, for they prefer to grow virtually exclusively among moss. In a forest, moss functions very much like a sponge. It captures much of the rainwater that falls upon it and flows down through it, and is very good at retaining that water, keeping the soil beneath it moist. So it would seem that the swollen stalk cat prefers well-drained but wet soil. Everywhere I find them, when I kneel down to examine them, my hands and knees immediately become wet. In fact, they would seem to enjoy damp soil and the company of moss so much that they burrow themselves into it. This mushroom, despite how large it is, can often be overlooked because its cap or pileus may just barely show above the moss. And at times I have virtually stumbled over them, spotting them when less than a meter away, only by noticing a slight bit of gray-white cap showing through tiny breaks in the moss. Other more common mushrooms also enjoy the same terrain, and their presence may be telltales of the swollen stalk cat's presence. Such fungi are Neolecta irregularis, the irregular earth tongue, various late-season rosulas, and even Amanita muscaria, the colorful Amanita that features in the art of so many fairy tale books. Do note, though, that Amanita muscaria is quite versatile in terms of where it'll grow, any place that can form mycorrhizal relationships with trees and find some moisture in the soil seems to be good enough for it. Sadly, one must also take note of the fact that just because one finds other fungi that are known to grow in the area of the swollen stalk cat, or even come across the right terrain, none of those mean that one will necessarily find the swollen stalk cat. It is, or at least has become, an uncommon mushroom. However, in terms of an edible, it is interesting. It has a lovely, dense flesh, giving it an excellent texture. You know the dense, almost rubbery texture that you'll find in the common grocery store sold button mushroom? The agaricus by sporus? Well, it's like that, but much more so. The flesh is very dense, which you can notice the moment you start cutting into it. And it's slightly bitter, but not in an unpleasant way, it's just a little. It's a mushroom that has a flavor of distinction, and I find that slight bitterness is easily camouflaged by a little butter, so that it's okay on its own, but its flavor has character that works even better with other foods, such as in pastas, on pizzas, or with steak, especially venison. But as this is an uncommon mushroom, it is important that if foragers do find it, they do two things. One, never share your mushrooming location, because other foragers will find them, and not having known that you harvested them, they'll harvest them too, which can lead to patches easily being over-harvested. As mushrooms go, this is a fairly slow-growing mushroom, and takes days to go from its first emergence above the soil to full maturity where it opens its cap and spreads its spores, making them especially vulnerable to over-harvesting. And because this mushroom can so easily be over-harvested, you yourself must be especially careful to leave at least a quarter of them behind. A quarter because various vermin are also fairly fond of this particular fungus. So responsible foragers will want to make sure that plenty survive so that they can leave their spores behind and continue on. All right, let's get on to learning how to identify this very interesting mushroom found in upper eastern and possibly western forests. Catathelasma ventricosum, the swollen stalk cat, is mycorrhizal with conifers. So if you find what appears to be a similar looking mushroom growing among hardwoods, it won't be a swollen stalk cat. Look for it upon gentle to steeply sloping ground, where the soil is richly covered in forest dust or spruce needles, and it is okay if there is the odd hardwood growing nearby and some hardwood leaves on the ground as well. But in particular, look for it in and among surface-dwelling mosses. And remember, the mushroom really does like to burrow itself into mosses. Often, you will just barely see the pileus, or cap, sticking out above the moss. But sometimes even that will be burrowed in, and you'll have to try to spot the mushroom crowns just barely peeking through the moss. Also, this is a fungus of autumn. The maritime Canadian provinces where I live are at the 45th parallel, exactly halfway between the equator and the poles. And I find that at this latitude and this climate, this mushroom likes to appear sometime between middle September and middle October. It likes it best when days are temperate, nights are cool, and there are abundant cool rains. Here, I've pulled one perfect for harvest from the moss. Notice the dirt on the lower third. 
Not only does this mushroom like to burrow itself into the moss, but into the earth too. And this mushroom's propensity to burrow itself into moss and dirt is so typical that it must be considered an identification characteristic. Of the mushroom's form, notice how it tapers, forming a cone shape, wide at the pileus, and narrow at the base. This is also an important identification characteristic of the swollen stalked cat. Note the complete veil that runs between the pileus and the stipe, or the cap and stem. When the mushroom is ideal and ready to use, this veil will still be fully attached, or nearly so anyway. The mushroom actually has two veils, and this is its inner, upper one. When fresh, it feels rubbery and silky, and it will actually stretch and flex a bit if you press a finger into it, though it is not hard to tear or cut away. The upper veil runs smoothly from the lip of the pileus to join the stipe just above the lower ring, and if you pierce the veil, you can see the gills right through it. We'll come back to the gills a bit later, as understanding them is also important to the mushroom's identification. The swollen stalk cat interestingly has a double veil, forming a double ring as the mushroom develops and sheds its veils. Rarely will you ever find the lower veil still attached, and it will appear only as an annulus or ring or ring scar below the upper ring. Sometimes it will be flattened against the stipe surface or worn off and barely visible, appearing only as a scar. Though with some practice, it or its scar can always be noticed, and one way to readily notice is below the lower of the double rings. The stipe is typically stained yellow-brown from its contact with the soil, but when the lower veil breaks, the upper part grows through moss and is therefore white to gray-white. When the swollen stalk cat is ideal for harvesting, it will still have a fully attached upper veil, as shown on the left, and it is still acceptable if the veil is beginning to develop a few holes or tears, as shown on the right. But as the mushroom continues to mature, its pileus will expand and the veil tear away, forming a typically pronounced upper ring and revealing the mushroom's gills. If you're going to forage the stalk cat as an edible, it is typically best to get it before this happens. Though, as long as it has not been ruined by vermin and rot has not had a chance to set in, I find it still to be plenty good. In fact, I ate the mushroom in the photo. All right, let's talk about the pileus. When young, the pileus of Catathalasma ventricosum is distinctly convex, and in color it ranges from white to gray, and at the very center the gray patches might become especially dark. Remember this mushroom begins life with two veils. There is an inner veil connecting between pileus lip and stipe that protects the gills, but there is an outer veil, which probably you will never see because it exists when the mushroom is yet undeveloped and still well down in the earthen moss. But long after the stalk cat has emerged, one can still find remnants of that veil in the form of what looks like scales of membrane on the cap, as well as little tears that reveal paler mushroom flesh beneath the membrane. Apart from the texture of the veil, the cap is smooth, hairless, and when wet can feel a little slippery. If you tap your finger against it, you can feel the denseness of the flesh. This mushroom is not hard nor woody, but it has a very firm flesh which to me is one of the things that makes it such an ideal delicacy. It has a texture I can only describe as rubbery, but in a good way, a very meaty kind of flesh. While the pileus is always convex, as it opens, it widens out. And as you can see here, in this matured stalk cat, the wide open cap has become fairly flat on top. If we look beneath the cap, we will find close to crowded gills that run partway down the stipe. These are called decurrent gills. In color, the gills may be off-white, or, if looked at in the right light, have a slightly pinkish hue to them. They share this trait with fresh agaricus mushrooms, their distant cousins, and you can readily see it in this image. The gills may run fully all the way from the stipe to the lip of the pileus, or, as shown in this crosscut, they may run only partway, creating partial plates. Notice also that the edge of the pileus turns back on itself, forming a lip that turns distinctly inward. This is another important identification characteristic of the swollen stalked cat. Another very interesting feature of the swollen stalked cat is that many of the gills will fork. Take a close look at the gills in the image above. Pause the video if you have to. You'll find some gills as full plates running all the way from the stipe to the lip of the pileus. You'll find many gills that start part way up the pileus, running out to the lip. Those are partial plates. But you'll also see plenty, roughly one-third to two-thirds from the lip, gills that fork. And this is not a gill growth pattern one sees all the time, and as such is another important identification trait of the swollen stalk cat. If you cut the stipe away and place the pileus upon a flat surface for 12 to 24 hours, the swollen stalk cats will yield a dense spore print, and with the gills so close and the mushroom so prolific, the spores are likely to look like a solid mass, 
leaving one unable to distinguish where they fell from individual gills, as is the case with many other mushrooms. As the mushroom matures, its cap will open out and its inner or upper veil tear away, revealing a stout cap and an especially thick, robust stipe, both comprised of very dense, almost unmistakably dense flesh, with the scars of a lower ring and usually a more pronounced upper ring where the veil connecting stipe to cap once was. However, there is an important identification trait that I've never seen mentioned anywhere, not in any field guide, nor in any literature online or in journals, and that's that this mushroom has a, you might call it a taproot. It's not really a taproot, but it's a dense growth of mycelia that connect it to its underground host fungus. Remember, a mushroom is just the fruiting body of a fungus that exists out of sight, dwelling in earth or wood typically. This taproot, so to speak, is substantial in size and easily viewed. I can't tell you how deep it runs because the ground in the highlands is exceedingly rocky, especially on the hillsides where it likes to grow. And usually it's only a few inches before I start having to pull away rock, but I can tell you it runs down several inches at least below the main mushroom. Because of its white color, especially when it's young, though as you can see in this image, the white coloration can persist well into maturity if conditions are right. And also because of the presence of veils and a lower scar that can emulate a vulva-like structure, it can be rightly said that this mushroom could be confused with certain Amanitas. I think it is more likely to be confused with some late season white Rasulas, like this one which was growing nearby. But I also believe that any naturalist or forager with at least moderate skill in mushrooms can easily tell them apart. There is the fact of the ferocinaceous smell, the pronounced inward turned lip on the pileus, the blotchy gray coloration on the pileus, the fact that this mushroom likes to burrow into both moss and earth as it grows, and with Rasulas, if you simply pick up a rusula and throw it against a tree, it will shatter, somewhat like glass. There are other differences too, so I do not consider that the likelihood of this mushroom being confused for a dangerous lookalike is all that high except by a complete novice. If you've happened to find this mushroom in the woods, appreciate it for its unique and robust beauty. Respect the fact it is uncommon, and if you are a forager as I am, be careful not to overharvest. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.